It's just a huge, huge honor to be in Sydney, Australia with six amazing people. Probably the six most amazing people in Australia. Angus Pryor, who's um, the older brother of Richard Pryor. <laughs> and, obviously, um, obviously. Can you will, you, will you end up going down like Richard Pryor? Um, I don't, how did he meet his demise? I don't know. I'm sure there was cocaine involved. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure the actual not. details. Probably, probably and not. we've done, we did an amazing podcast. It's 796. 796. I can't believe we're almost 800. Um, David Moffat, there's no one on earth who doesn't know about you and your big yellow book. Where is your big yellow book? It's in the, it's in the, it's in the bag. I'm sorry, I haven't got it here. My but, gosh. Uh, I was the first Australian you podcasted. Oh. I was. You were number... Um, 151? Is that 151. There you go. Plug the Leaks with David Moffat. And then next is his lovely wife. Now, do you, do you are you public that you guys are married even though you kept well, your name Jane Bandy? Today we can't be public. Yeah. Today. <laughs> she's coming out of the closet today. <laughs> uh, she's uh, Jane Bandy. You had a outstanding podcast, Dental Phone Excellence with Jane Bandy, where we address the incredible weird phenomena that 10 people have to land on your website before one converts to call, three people have to call to convert one to come in. Three people have to come in with a cavity for one to convert to drill phone bill. So when you look at the average American dental office of 750,000 collection, taking home 180. So to do that 750, to do that one filling, three had to come in. For three to come in, nine had to call. For nine to call, 90 had to land on your website. I mean, look at that messed up steps. funnel yes. <laughs> and you should go back and listen to her, her um, podcast and bring your staff because if you can fix anything in that funnel I mean why do 10 people have to land to convert one to call fix that why do three have to call before one to come in Jane fixes that and why do three people have to have a cavity for you to convince one to get treatment crazy and then we have Trevor Martin and Trevor Martin your website is is um, Gunts Gunts Goons Dental. Goons.com.au. Goons Dental. And it's a, you're a dental supply? We're a dental supply house. And we provide everything for a one-stop uh, shopping uh, for a dental professional. to provide oral health care to help all Australians and New Zealanders get better oral health. Great. And, um, and then next to you, we have uh, Kinar Shaw. And your podcast was... 395, the ABCs of leadership in dentistry with Kanar Shah. That was an amazing podcast. Thanks for coming back and doing another one. And Dr. Angie Pappas, um, she won't do a podcast with me. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only one. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for that. I want to be the 1,000. So you want to be number 1,000? Yes. All right, so Ryan, we will do her. her. <laughs> she will be our 1,000. We're, we're coming up. What number is this going to be, Ryan? 800. Not yeah, not so far. not not far. So um, what I want to talk about is um, this is the I think it's the sixth time I've come down here. I started coming down here. I think it was in 1990 or 95. I, I for every five years I used to do this tour where um, I would come in lecture in Melbourne. I mean, no, I'd fly from Los Angeles to um, Auckland, lecture Auckland, New Zealand, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, Brisbane or Gold Coast, and then over to Perth. In the back home. I do five cities in 10 days and I did that tour like every five years and I remember when I first came down here the problem was everybody had everybody was booked out two months in advance and no one wanted to hear about marketing They're like why would you do marketing I mean my problem is people are mad they can't get in and so fast forward from 1990 to 2017 and your country basically doubled the number of dental schools to nine let in a thousand dentists from Asia. Um, um, corporate dentistry has come in. And then something very, very um, unique to Australia is the health insurance companies like Bupa are uh, now in several hundred dental offices. So the point I'm trying to make, now it's game on. You, you, it's, there's competition. Yeah. When I came down here first time, this was the Wild West. There were kangaroos walking down the street, <laughs> and now this is world-class competition in dentistry. So we'll just uh, we'll start with you and go around, uh, Angus. It, do you agree with my assessment that it's more Absolutely. competitive now than ever? Than ever. Look, I'm a relative newcomer to the industry, but the reality is I wouldn't have a business but for this scenario. Um, 
as an outsider, I looked pretty closely at it for a while, and the numbers are just as you say. I think it's 2,200 plus new dentists in the last three years. Wow. Uh, and for a relatively small number of dentists in Australia, that's a big hike. Because there's not even 20,000 of us. Around yeah, 20,000, uh, 20, yeah. I think it is. So you just added 10% yeah, more years. dentists in three years. Yeah. That's that's huge. And I, like a week wouldn't go by where I had a dentist contacting me um, saying, basically, what can you do? And once upon a time, you could stick out your sign or you welcome that and that was it. And that's those days in most of Australia is gone. So, so um, you're on, in the field, you're in, in the heat of it. When dentists are calling you, what is their problem and what are you doing for them? Um, so I've had uh, two people contact me in the last two days and one said, because I have, there's a question they've got to fill in, you know, to set up an appointment. And one of them said um, something about a big practice nearby and I think it was a corporate, so that was one of them. And then the other one just talked about competition in general. Uh, and so I guess what we do is really we go back to basics with marketing and, and try to hit it kind of at about six different levels simultaneously and get a cumulative effect and a raise. Um, I think the thing that we're not so big into that sometimes our clients think they want or need is the kind of silver bullet, you know, that we're just going to come with the newest piece of technology or the newest app and that's going to fix all their problems. But um, you know, we look at a whole bunch of stuff. How effective is their patient referral systems? How if, are they working with local businesses to refer? Are they are they measuring call conversion? Um, those, you know, 90 into one, that's just mm. crazy. So, and if that is the case, um, and I don't doubt the numbers, then there's actually plenty of business there. They just need to be optimizing the whole way through to get a better outcome. You know, it, it's funny because in, in every industry, the highest paid employee is always in sales. I mean, you go into any small business and you look at payroll, and you got all these people that maybe make ten, fifteen, twenty dollars an hour, but you say, "Well, who's these four people that make over a hundred thousand a year?" And one's the owner, and the other three are the salespeople. Then you go to dentistry, and where the calls come in, that person's their their career is named after a piece of furniture. She's the front desk lady. <laughs> we were gonna name her a chair. We were gonna name her chair lady, but we thought uh, name her after the desk. Yeah, we give her a promotion. And in every other business, that would be incoming sa incoming sales. Mm. And then when someone falls through the cracks and didn't make their appointment or didn't come back or whatever, that would be an outbound sales. And you'd have like a sales manager on top of those phones. And that would be the highest paid position in the deal. And you go to any dental company in America, you go to Ultradent, you go to Denmat. I mean, they have call rooms at Smart Practice. They have call rooms and that's the most sophisticated part of the whole business. And then you go into a dental office and it takes 90 people to get one to get a filling. I mean, that it's, it's insanity. Well, if you just look at the, the numbers that you said, I mean, for that 90 to one, there's about four points there where if you could improve the ratios, even just by five or 10%, the cumulative effect of that is quite significant. Um, so I, I just think it requires some pretty sustained focus, a bit of know-how, um, but the results, you can turn things around reasonably quickly. I, I'm not a shiny object guy. I think the basics are the basics and if you, provide outstanding service and you make it easy for people to do what they do then the rest takes so your itself. your website is dentalprofitsystem.com yeah dentalprofitsystem.com so what is what is your deal is it a is it a contract is it a year-long fee this dentistry uncensored what do you cost what is there a contract no contract um, how does it work we, we've got because we're a full service marketing agency, it depends. So for some people, we're just doing video or graphic design or whatever. Thank you. Um. Is that the Richard Pryor <laughs> cocaine and coke? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> but unfortunately, I have to drink it rather than snorting it. The thing that we're probably selling the most is a six month fast track program where we focus on these sort of six or eight factors. Uh, in succession, uh, and that starts at about three and a half. Thirty-five hundred dollars. Yeah, for per month or for the whole six no, months. No, that's for the six months. Yeah. And you know, and it's you said you're not a shiny object man. I, I've told these dentists every day for seven hundred and eighty days that the number one return on investment in dentistry is always getting your house in order. 
It's always a consultant. Absolutely. It's never buying a shiny object. And if this restaurant was going bankrupt, think how absurd it would be if this bankrupt was going bankrupt. And we all looked and said, well, the problem is, you know, serving Greek food. If we had, if we added a Greek fettuccine salad, you know, or bone grafting, or sleep apnea, or Invisalign, we'd fix. Nobody would say that. They'd say, your house ain't in order. Yeah. Fix the restaurant. It ain't the menu. Yeah. You know, if you can't make, if you can't be rich off. Cleanings, exams, x-rays, fillings, extractions, root canals, then you know, something's incredibly wrong. And, and look, um, what I'm describing to you is the journey that we've been on as a business. You know, we started as a digital marketing agency and we did lots of uh, Google AdWords and so on. And they, it kind of works to a point, but the marketplace just keeps changing. And we found that this kind of getting back to basics approach is where we get the best return for our clients. So I'm a pragmatist. If it works, that's what I'm interested in. And you know, every time I hear a coach in the NFL, when they get their butt kicked on a Sunday and lose 50 to nothing, they come back and they say, we need to focus on four things. What is a block? What is a tackle? What is a catch? What is a pass? We need to go back to basics. And that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it's I, not some complicated flea flicker no, play. It's not. I mean, it's it, go back to the basics. Maybe I could, you know, dress it up uh, with something that it's not. But I just, this is what we find is working at the moment in Australia. So that's why we're doing it. So David, yeah. where's your? I don't recognize you without your big yellow book. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't carry it all the time. Now. <laughs> it's like I've got it in a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I agree with Angus. It's uh, it's about the basics. The trouble is, everybody out there is looking for just add water, instant success. Yes, yes. You know, like here's the dirt, here's the seed. Just add the water, and next month I've got double the practice. And it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way. They've got to put in the effort. And a lot of them think, well, you can do it. They say to me, you can do it, but that's you. You're different. I'm not you. But I'm nothing special. I did it in, you know, I didn't do it here where Dory lives in Sydney Harbour. I did it 20 miles upstream where, where people live in five row houses and drive average cars and have average jobs. But I built a successful practice based on treating people nice and getting people to come and stay and knowing the numbers. The trouble with dentists these days is that they want everything now and they're not even knowing their numbers. You say, how much is a new patient worth to you? They give you a number that ends in three zeros. They got no idea. They say 1,000, 2,000. They got no idea. Even if it ends in 500, they got no idea. And they tell you that. How many new patients did you get last month? They say, oh, about 50. That means probably about 19. You know, they don't give you exact numbers. And so these are the people who want just add water. It's crazy. They've got to get in and do the work though. That's the problem. The problem is that a lot of it is wastage, as you said. And you, you explained the wastage just getting them into the office. Then there's wastage in the office because, as you said, three come in, only one gets a filling. And that's just one filling. What about everything else that gets diagnosed? People come in and they leave and they go, oh, that person wasn't interested. They weren't interested because, as you said, you know, your service was lousy, your front desk lady was lousy. You know, when, when people walk in, a friend of mine's a hairdresser. People walk into his salon and the person cutting hair at the front looks up and then goes back to cutting the hair. He says, why didn't you greet that person? Not my client. And that happens in a dental office. Somebody walks into a dental office and they're doing some work and they just sit there doing work. It's crazy. Instead of that person is going to pay money that's going to keep the business going. Why aren't they spending time with that person? And dentists are too busy, like you said, buying more equipment. What they need is buy more people to work in their office so that things move quickly, so that the patient moves along instead of having the patient have to wait. Have to wait to check in, have to wait to go to the dentist, have to wait for the chair to be clean, have to wait to come out. You know, I was talking, I've got a practice I worked with in Pennsylvania. They had five hygienists. They worked out that they only had three receptionists. Guess what happens every hour when the five hygiene patients come out? They got a log jam of people waiting to pay. He said, that's not working. I said, we've got to fix that. They don't see that it's about service. You know, it's funny what you said. They, they want to buy a piece of shiny equipment, uh, which uh, I'm sure Trevor Martin was like, yes, you need to buy that shiny equipment. But, but the, the funny thing about that is, if you, standard Boston consulting advice, you know, these big consulting companies, 
they, they, they'll go to a company and they'll say, well, we want to double our sales. Well, what did, the first thing you should do is double your sales force. And if you have six salesmen, um, what's going to be easier? They get six salespeople to all double their sales or to get six more salespeople. And why would you buy a, and so in a dental office, half the incoming calls go to voicemail. Yes. And if they bought another human and every call was answered on the third ring, and whenever you picked up the phone, you could have five, 10 minutes to have a, an amazing touch point, customer service, close the sale, trying to convert them to come in, that alone could double their revenue. I but did, they'll go buy a laser instead. I did a phone audit for a client recently and I called 10 businesses in Melbourne and in 15 minutes, I had in my mind a very clear impression of, this is a group of practices that I'd be happy to deal with. This is a group of practices where they sit on the fence and this is a group of practices that I would never deal with on the basis of a one minute phone call. So you could have world-class marketing, you could have world-class dentistry, and one minute on the phone, there was a clear group. I was like, I don't know who they are, but I never want to deal with them. Absolutely. Was one of those calls, Jane? <laughs> Did you call Jane on that call? Yeah, no, I did not. <laughs> Jane, what's your take on this? Oh, it's very fascinating because, like, as you know, David and I both work together, and I think it, it was just, you know, I'm taking what um, Angus was just saying, what you were saying about, you know, people ping, people ringing the, the office and not being converted and and it, it's just, it, it's just the core element that's needed, like the digital marketing brings the patients in and then they're relying on heavily. I, I am so surprised at how many digital marketing companies have approached me to work alongside me to say, hey, you know, my clients, I'm sending them good leads, but they're not converting the calls to patients. So there's no one sitting, well, the people sitting in the chair, but not what they should be. So, you know, rather than pouring all this money into, into marketing initially, it does need to be needed, but, you know, that internal marketing really needs to be focused on probably first. Yeah. And then going back into saying, well, how do we supplement this? And now how do we put this all into action? So all those systems are in place. But, um, you know, I remember when first starting at your practice, every single person that rang our phone, no, seriously, every single person made an appointment. It was easy, as you said. Mm. That was just, they were the golden years, you know. There are golden years to come, I know, with baby boomers. That was the golden years, or you were the golden girl answering the phone? <laughs> <laughs> When I do my workshops, I used to think I was this young chick until I started doing my workshops going, oh my God, I'm so old. <laughs> but I think they like that experience that I have. And, and, and I think that's the thing that's been so successful for me, doing what I do and niching myself so much into phone communication and patient communication is that I've sat in the chair. I've done what I'm actually educating these people to now do, the front office people. <laughs> So, Go. so what are what are some advice on how to increase your conversion costs? Because, like on that funnel, I mean, I mean, look at the website. Like, ten people land on your website for one mm -hmm. to convert, and I, I see every single dentist that sends me an email. Uh, I if they have their link, I always click it to look at. It. Just out of curiosity, who am I? Who am I talking with? Young, old? You know, where, where do they live? A couple, couple of things. Num number one, no one puts their country on the website, so you know um, everybody assumes that you know where the city. Licked and licked and glam, you know. So you usually have to drop the address in Google Maps and say, "Oh, that's Austria." Kind of be nice if you put Austria on your damn website, but nobody puts the country on the website. Um, the majority of all the websites look like they bought it at a dental. Uh, the website at a dental convention five, ten years ago. Um, I, I can't believe how many of um, uh, the pictures are a stock photo yeah. of like four people laying in a park. It's like, and you're looking at a name like. You know, Dr. Askin, Salami, Wami, whatever the heck, you know that guy in the stock photo is not the guy. And um, it just, it's just amazing how um, the, like when I see a, a picture of someone looks like a mugshot, that, that's not warm and fuzzy, but everybody has a video. And you click the video and then this guy comes to life and he's like, you know, and you, you feel something. You're like, well, that, that's a nice guy. Let, let that guy work on me. And, and the, but then when they call the office, why does, that's where your expertise, why do three people have to call your office before the front desk lady um, can convert one to come in? I think one of the 
things that fails on the front desk is that they forget that person has a dental concern and a dental problem. Um, they get focused on their first question, not realising that they can put everything away that their mother ever t said to them about not answering a question with a question. They need to then start to go into asking their own questions and finding out more before they address what has been asked of them initially. And I think that's you know part of what I do is I take them through those steps of what sort of questions do we ask so that we can find out more, be an investigator, and to be able to then address what their real issues are. Because often that first question that they ask, and we've all heard this before, mm -hmm. it's not like, you know, what I'm doing is not that avant-garde, it's just that it's not being done in most dental practices. And, and everyone and knows then, what they need to do, but it's still... And then they're on the phone trying to do this, and the lazy-ass hygienist like, okay, schedule her for a cleaning in six yeah. months. Why don't you schedule her for a cleaning in six Fantastic. months? That, I'm talking yeah. on the damn phone, and you know where the yeah. hygienist doesn't want to schedule it? Because because when that patient doesn't schedule, says, well, I'll call you, doesn't look bad on her, yeah. because it was the hygienist dropped the I mean, the receptionist dropped the ball. Yeah. But, it, but, at the, but at the end of the day, you say to your hygienist, you saw eight people and you only scheduled six for a recall. Mm -hmm. Why did these two people not schedule? Yeah. Was it because you, they didn't value what you did? And then the assistant's coming up there, oh, can you schedule her for a crown seat? Well, number, number one, you can't schedule a crown seat because how do I know it? Is this tooth had a root canal? Am I just seeming a crown on a dead stump? Or is it vital? Are they freaked out? Do, will they need, a nit or they need nitrous oxide? Do, do I need a half hour appointment? Do I need 15 yeah. minutes? So I, I want every, if it has to be done from the back, the back do it because the lady talking on the phone, mm -hmm. I don't know who the hell's calling and I don't know if I'll be on this phone two minutes or 20 minutes. Yeah, and I think that accountability as well, I think that's gonna change in the future the sort of people we're hiring for these positions, working, communicating with patients, that initial communication. We need to step it up and we need to say, okay, we can't just hire someone who smiles, who's friendly, yeah. That's not enough anymore. It is important, but it's not enough. And for people to be, you know, well, well educated. I, I used to use the word trained, but I, I felt that there was a much better word to use. And I think educated, and accountable, and and responsible for their part in the business. And I don't think that happens a lot of the time with the people that we hire on the front office. And um, in America, they still say educated. Yeah. Educated. <laughs> It's like sometimes it's like, oh, we can't, we, no one's applied for the job, or we just can't find anyone. People are applying that aren't qualified. Well, what are your qualifications? What do you expect them to do when you hire them to answer your phone? Be really clear on that. And I think when you ask dentists that, they, they, don't, they don't know themselves. So it's mm. hard for them to get clear about something they don't know. And it's so funny, all these corporate, all, all these dentists pay their associate in America. The, the going rates mm. in, in the urban is 25% of adjusted production yeah. and in the rural it's 40 percent but but the lowest like say in 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 the fortune 500 the highest paid people are the sales team yeah. and the dental office is the lowest paid people and it's like well why, why don't you pay your receptionist a percentage of all the dentistry she books yeah why why, why is that the lowest tech lowest paid yeah. you know i mean um, i had a phone call yesterday and and it was a fairly confidential phone call but it was from someone who'd attended my workshop and she rang me out of the blue and she said, Jane, I'm really confused and stuck. I've asked my employer um, that, you know, what's happening, I've let him know what's happening in the practice and we're, we've sort of outgrown just having me on the front office. Um, someone's just left, we need someone to be able to do all these things now so we continue this growth. And he said, I can't afford to do that at the moment. And she said, I, and I told him what you said at my workshop. And I thought, oh gosh, what was that? <laughs> she said, I remember when you said, um, the, the question is, I haven't got enough people, because I get asked this a lot, what if we haven't got enough people to answer the phones? The answer is just get more people to answer the phones. And sometimes you've just got to maybe not, you know, buy that piece of machinery straight away to be able to get your priorities. And you know, it, it's, it's also it's yeah. also interesting how patient management is, I mean, practice management in two words is patient management. Practice management is patient mm -hmm. management. And the phone's also like, like say I'm the owner doctor and these are my two associates. The, it's it's the people answer the phones that are sitting there saying, you know, every time, Ang, you know, Angus you always uses the electrosurge. And his patients are always calling call back saying they're in severe pain. Uh, can you call them in a pain medication? And she uses a uh, little diode laser 
and we never had that. I mean, I mean, the, not only inbound sales, but for these corporate dental chains, they like to centralize their call centers because if, if you're Heartland, all those calls roll over to Effingham, the, the, the headquarters in Effingham, Illinois, and they, they've got 500 offices, they've got seven, 800 dentists spread out in 500 offices, and they can bullseye pinpoint, wow, we got a, we got a crazy doctor in office number 123, people are upset, people are, are complaining, I mean, I mean the, the phones is just everything. Mm -hmm. and, and the biggest, most sophisticated operations focus more on inbound calls, outbound calls, and trying to, you know. Yeah, and I realized this week when I made a doctor's appointment online that I had a very speedy, efficient way to now book into my doctor because my doctor's receptionist, I know this has been a bit of a, um, and we're not efficient at answering the phone. So all of a sudden I had this, and, and we don't want it to get to that. We, we still want to have, you know, people booking online because I'm a, I was very against it at first and now I'm seeing that that's millennials want to do that after hours. They want to be able to book an appointment when it- Well, it reminds me, oh, it oh, reminds oh, me yeah. when I was little, I, I'll never forget. I, I never saw any technology coming. I mean, I never forget my dad and I, we're walking to National Bank of Wichita on 21st and West Street, Wichita, Kansas, and they just installed this ATM machine. And we were looking at it, and this guy's standing there, and we go in there, and my dad and I are looking, and like, well, what idiot would do that when you could come in and talk to this nice lady, and we do our banking? And then we come out, he's still there, and we go up there, stand there, and like, what are you doing? And he's like, and we're just like, yeah, th this will never take off. But now you see people prefer an ATM machine over well, the bank teller. And, and the banks don't want you to come in. Yeah. That's, that involves paying a person rather than a bit of technology. So. Yeah. And that person will only work 40 hours a week. The ATM machine will work 168 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So who, who's book, who's scheduling online? What software? Um, I'm, I'm not health that... It was is health it health, oh, this is through my doctor. Was the, it's healthengine.com.au. Well, I think all Straight away I went to have a look how many dentists yes. are doing this. And I've got all the names of all the dentists, like obviously close to me. For health engine? Yeah, it's called healthengine.com.au. And, um, Ryan, so can you send me that? Healthengine.com.au, and yeah. it has a list of the dentists where you can schedule online. Yeah, and it was I found it really efficient because I'm I'm because I was so at first against dentists having it on their website. I've now realised that you just can't you can't not have that that extra uh, resource. At the in in America, um, the most um, popular or the most pleasing practice management software is called Open Dental. And they have an online, uh, a, a little Most thing. Most software's yeah, got it yeah. in Australia. Yeah. 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 Um, Most price manager software has it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, but I think it's setting, for Windows yeah. got it, OIS So they, they have an open dental yeah. down here version. They're, a lot of the surgeries, you can actually go yeah. online on your phone I think and the, make an appointment. Yeah. You biggest, say surgery, is that dental surgery? Dental surgery. Yeah. 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 Dental surgery. But I think the biggest mistake they make, and I don't know why they do it, because we don't do it when we're on the phone. Um, well, I'm trying to educate people not to do this. You don't reveal your whole appointment book. Yeah. And that's where, like at yes. first yes. it's like, yes. they're not very busy. Yes. And yeah. their whole yeah. appointment book's there. And that's something that I try and educate teams not to do, just to give, you know, very narrow dis uh, choices for patients so you're in control of your appointment book. So you immediately lose control. Yeah. Um, the other thing is the types of questions that they ask to be able to efficiently book in the right appointment. Yeah maybe is not being made. So I think there is that, there's a place for it, but also to follow it up with a phone call and make that connection. Because you still need a connection because without it, they're more inclined to then cancel their appointment or not show up. Yeah, completely agree with yeah. that. See, uh, we've tried the system before and um, the statistics have shown in my case that that doesn't work. Mm. Uh, especially the leads you get from there are not quality leads. Yeah. They yeah. just book yeah. in and then they yeah. never show up. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no really yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that was your experience at the online booking. Correct, correct. And they didn't plus, show. like you said, you don't reveal your books and or, you know. So yeah. it's best to get them connection. But even they were leaving phone numbers and we used to connect with them. They would do that to two, three places. You know, oh, they would book. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. So they're not fully committed. And millennials do that than... with restaurants too. Yes. Where are we going Saturday night? They'll book, book three, three or four restaurants yes. on a Saturday night, yeah. and then they go to one and one. leave the others. Correct. So, so if you if you make that follow up call, that now can I, are you talking about online booking appointments or online dating? I think both, you're confusing me too. Both of us are No, you're getting no shows on your online dating. Deeper can I? Even our restaurants make you confirm your booking. 
Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so if you don't respond, yes, I'll do that in my yes. We'll send them an SMS two days before, and we have, I tell all the patients if they don't reply within 24 hours, their appointment will be automatically given. Now, SMS is a text? Yes. No, text myself. But, it, but the downside is they haven't developed that love for you. You know, like like that phone call and that connection that you make, it's all of a sudden, yeah. I'm not saying they fall in love with you straight away, yeah, right. but it's a, it's a beginning of love. The and phone call is the most important bit for yeah. yeah. Because yeah. you're relying on your receptionist to edify you and edify the, yeah. the practice, so then the, uh, the patients will want to come in. Absolutely, no, absolutely. Because yeah. we all well, know well, cancellations are not. Yeah, but shows. perhaps the first uh, response is really an email back saying thank you very much for your booking or your reservation or for your appointment. This is what you can expect when you come to our practice. Well, your software should be automated to do that anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, yeah, yeah, but it needs a little bit of personalisation. And then, well. but then you, yeah. you need to follow it up with verbal. I you still think there's a place for it. You can, you can it. massage yeah. it with verbal. Yeah. See, we've tried all that, exactly what you just said, but still yeah. the leads are not quality. So yeah. you get pretty much one out of sometimes one or two out of ten really and, showing up. And straight away I know you're measuring that. Yeah. Yeah, which of is, course. Which is the other thing is measure measure to know where you get where you're starting from and then measure yeah. along the way. I always believe that what David just said that measure success mm. comes in two ways, major and measurable. Mm. No, so you success cannot, comes in two ways. Major and measurable. Major and measurable. measurable. Yes, yeah, so you cannot have major success if you're not measuring. Mm. Yeah. No, and I, I completely believe in that. Yeah. So every dentist should be measuring pretty much everything yeah. in the practice. But yeah. David's right. The phrases that I use, and this is what I get when I do strategy calls with dentists, when I ask them the question, it's usually, I think it is, yeah. it could be, maybe, and they're all words that you don't want to be using. If you measure it, you never use those words. This is it. This this is is these it. are the Correct. numbers. And, and that takes time and something systematic to set up so that you're doing that consistently as well. Because there's no point just doing it for a short period of time. It's all, what's that a measure for, really? Sure. Trevor, I, I, um, when I look at other industries, like, um, like restaurant, like, like every industry, I mean, the whole value chain works together. And when I look at dentistry, it is the least utilized value chain. For instance, like the insurance company, um, I send this dental office $250,000 a year. And then uh, some office I've been in where one company will give them half a million a year. I'll say, well, who's the CEO of that company? No idea. Really, a guy in your town gave you half a million dollars? You don't even freaking know his name? Are you, are you that dumb? And... Um, you, uh, you know, I, I tell dentists that um, all the labs are afraid of dentists. Every lab man is fearful of calling a dentist saying, you know, I'd really like you to retake that impression. Because he's afraid that the low self esteem doctor is going to say, what? My impression's perfect. I'm God. I'm going to get a new lab. And they'll lose the whole damn account. So they all live in fear. And I tell dentists that you need to go to the lab man and say, don't be afraid of me. I'm not an abusive asshole and I want to be a better dentist. And you can go down there and he'll show you all the incoming impressions. He'll make you a better dentist. Same thing with the supply person. That, that dentist only sees his office. How many offices do you see? Eight and a half thousand. Yeah, so I mean, so here's a guy that's seen 8,500 offices and all you see yourself. So certainly you've noticed that the dental offices buying more supplies are doing some things differently than the dental offices who are in your over 30, over 60, over 90 account receivables. Yep. So, so I think just going back to the original uh, issue about what, one of the things I think is the difficulty in dentistry in Australia is that we're competing for uh, in the healthcare environment, and there's more dollars being there's, that spend that people have for healthcare is being spread over so many different things like um, fitness, like uh, looking good, and dentistry became very aesthetic. And so I think that we're not just competing against our other dentists, we're competing against other healthcare spend. And I think we're also competing against other discretionary spend. So more travel is being done these days. So people are spending more on travel than in dentistry. We still haven't explained why people need to spend more money or that percentage of health, what they're prepared to spend in healthcare from their budget on dentistry. And that's something that I think, in the, to your point about industry, uh, to um, the profession, uh, working together is an opportunity we have because we can't even promote that message to our people who work for us. Mm -hmm. So not everybody in our practices, not everybody in our businesses go to the dentist on a regular basis. 
Mm. And one of the issues in Australia, I think, is because dentistry is expensive, and people perceive mm. dentistry as being expensive. And so therefore you come back to that question about equipment and about reception and how you welcome people in, into your business. Because, because they're paying what they perceive to be a significant amount of money. Your patient coming in the door is paying what they consider is a large expenditure. They want to see where that money is being spent. So they want a nice environment. They want to see that you're spending investing in technology or at least in, in uh, know what's going on in technology and know why you have it and why you don't. And, so, and therefore your practice and all the people who work for you need to know what you have and why you have it. I was in a practice the other day and the, the um, uh, receptionist, the chief salesperson as you call her, uh, took a telephone call and the person asked for uh, an in-chair whitening um, provision using a lamp and she says no we don't have a lamp and hung up but that practice does in-chair whitening not using a lamp because the dentist believes that's a better uh, provision of service or treatment than using a lamp so she yeah. just forgot to tell them what she did well she didn't even forget she just she just yeah you're not being kind of yeah, they're, they're not communicating so so, so i think uh i think what the, the, the challenge for um, for dentistry here is not just to see their dentist next door as the competitor it's to be able to see how um that that whole healthcare spend and I think dentists, to a certain extent, it's a personal view, of course, but to a certain extent, are uh, looking at dollars rather than remembering that they're, they're in a healing profession. Yeah. So the oral healthcare profession is a healing profession. And to your point, doing those basics on, you know, around preventative, you know, doing a proper uh, oral inspection, doing a proper hygiene appointment, uh, it, it dismays me that that basic service is discounted as a lost leader for implant surgery. And, 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 and I see that as front and centre of providing health care and looking at your patient, not terms, in terms of saying how much am I going to get out of that appointment, or maybe two or three appointments to complete a treatment plan, but a whole of life view. And, and, and that's 101 business from my point of view. When I'm talking to my salespeople and my staff at Good Stental, what we're talking to them about is saying, that, that dentist that oral healthcare professional is going to be in business for 40 years doing dentistry. How, what's the total worth of that practice to us? What's the total worth of what goes on in that practice? That's what we've got to look for because our business has been around for 81 years. We hope to be around, hope to have a strategy by the way, but we've been around <laughs> for uh, another 80 years as a privately owned um, uh, company, the only privately owned uh, or the leading private young dental distributor in Australia, New Zealand. And we, we want to be able to say, in 80 years' time, we're providing services for those dentists. And we forget that total total life. So I, I think we have to work on that. I think as a profession, as an industry, we need to work together in terms of driving that. And we get really caught up in, in am I going to maintain my lifestyle as an oral healthcare professional? Yeah. Our business talks about um, helping oral health care professionals to provide the best possible care. If I get all my team doing that, being focused on that, the dollars will come. I will get more customers. And I, I think we forget that in, uh, in when we run our individual practices. We, we um, sorry, we, uh, when I see uh, uh, our customers work, I think we forget that sometimes. We need to think about how, how, how we drive that message to all of our staff of how we give our patients a really good experience around the healing process. Trevor, when you look at, you said eight and a half thousand offices you sell, that you sell to. Mm -hmm. Do demographics matter? I've, I've heard some people, do demographics matter? No, not, not, not in my view, because I, I see practices in low social dem what we would frame as low social demographic area, being highly productive, providing good oral care, and, and being profitable businesses, very successful. What about rural versus urban? Yeah, I think uh, the, it's, it, the question there is about demand for service. But, but what, we're, what I think, uh, and in Australia, we, a bit like America, but we, we look at metro, regional, and rural. 
as three different aspects. And if you look, and the government's been saying this for a long time, whether you agree with it or not, but um, the, the challenge is providing people in rural areas, and in some cases some regional areas in Australia, adequate oral health care. If, if people are prepared to move out of the metro areas to um, regional and rural areas, there's actually uh, a population, a group of people who want to be seen. But there's the attraction of the cities. But uh, two of our universities have been established in, in regional areas to really provide um, dentists for regional and rural communities. Is it working? I think there's still some... Yeah. This Gennar, you were telling me how many dentists are within two kilometers of you? I would say um, my practice is in the city, just about seven minutes walk from here. It's probably about two hundred, over two hundred dentists. Yeah. And right. how small of an area? Two kilometers. Yeah. Two square kilometers. Two square kilometers there's two hundred dentists. Yeah, even more, I would say. Yeah. How, how do you survive with two hundred dentists and two square kilometers? Well, it's, it's a great question. Every dentist asks themselves nowadays, doesn't it? Um, it's one of those things when I'm, I'm speaking to Dennis, I'm always asking, what's the number one thing that stops a dental practice owner from achieving their ideal dream practice? What's the number one thing? And mo most of the time, the answer is a, a form of an obstacle. Either it's a lack of talent or a lack of resource or lack of time, or, you know? But that's not it. See, the number one thing that stops most people from achieving their dreams is something good that's helpful. So a good job, a good marketing strategy, a good level of customer service, you know, a, 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 a good way of presenting the way they presented the surgery. But it's no more about that. As you were saying earlier on, um, they need to work on their house first nowadays to become, to become known in the market. It's not about just being good, it's about going from good to great. Because you won't survive in this market if you're just good. And that's where I think the key point of most dental practices now is that most people, most dental practices are feeling the pain that they're not surviving or they're barely surviving in this market because um, you know there's a lot of competition nowadays uh, online even marketing like most a lot of dentists are doing marketing so it's a competitive market out there um, everyone knows that they need to amp up the customer service so everyone's working on that so it's not about being good anymore it's all about being great how can you go and work towards being great. I, I sincerely believe there's six areas in a dental practice. Every dental, every dental practice owner should be working on, you know, pretty much every single day. Uh, six areas in a dental practice where either you can win or lose a patient. Um, you know, the first, first area being marketing. I mean, we all believe that marketing is one of the first ways to get the public know that you even exist. You could be the best dentist in the world, but if people don't know you exist, how, how are you letting them know that you're there to serve them? So the first product is marketing, and there's two forms of marketing as we all know. The external marketing, where Angus talks about, of course, the SEO, the PPC. The, nowadays we talk about social media. Social media is huge. Back in the day, 10 years ago, we were not talking about that, but we need to be proactive on there, social media. And then there's the internal marketing. How do you get your referrals, your reviews, and get internal marketing, your current existing patients referring other patients. So this is the first way uh, where you can either win or lose a patient. I think the second way is when they um, call into your practice and as Jane was saying, telephone skills. One of the most important things uh, in a dental practice. I mean, uh, I'm so you, proud, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you need to be teaching that actively, you know? Yeah. And I'm glad you're doing that, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, um, statistically speaking, when I'm coaching dentists, I see about 60 to 70% failure in booking appointments from a phone call to actually uh, booking an appointment. So, you know, out of every 10 patients calling in, only three are getting booked, three to four. So there's a huge area to be worked upon there, going from, again, good to great. How do you give that exceptional um, customer service, uh, even the language skills used over the telephone? Uh, over the telephone? And, uh, and one of the biggest uh, things I believe over the phone is attitude. You know, just a nice, bubbly attitude. Make the other person feel that, you know, you want it and we, we are ready to help you, we are ready to serve you. And we, we I know, always say, can I hire attitude first? Hire attitude first. <laughs> Put that on the top Correct. of the head. I still remember the one day, work on. one day when I was advertising for a, um, you know, dental front desk, as we call it, not the front chair, <laughs> you know, I actually put an ad for, um, for an air hostess. Huh. For an air hostess? For an air hostess, because air hostess is the number one 
uh, service industry is the aerospace industry. You know, because they're trained to deal with people on a daily basis. So rather than aiming for anyone in a local market, I said, I want to interview some air hostesses. Yeah. And I gave it a shot, and it worked out really well. You know, what is an air hostess? Like a flight attendant? Flight attendant. Yeah. 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 Oh, a flight yeah. attendant, okay. yes. Because they are in the business of giving customer service. But and did, it's good did, did you have, have to offer free travel to them? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and good if you practice crashes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's the second area, where the, the telephone skills. And again, in telephone skills, it's all, all about using the la right language. I mean, one of the things about, what, the three most important skills we are not taught as being a dentist is business skills, leadership skills, and communication skills. We're not taught these skills in university, in dental school. And uh, we, we are almost coming to the real world, ended up buying practices, and we, are, we almost assume that we need to know how to run a business. And as all dentists all wear two hats, you know, one is the um, clinician hat yeah. and one is the entrepreneur hat, you know, and we are not taught nothing about being the entrepreneur. And this, you know, and then most dentists are complaining, I'm a really good clinician, but I don't seem to be running a good practice. And this is why they don't yeah. have the business leadership and communication skills. Um, that leads me to the third point. So once they book in and do come make an appointment, how is your customer service when they come into your practice. How are they treated? Are you giving a seven star service? Nothing less than that, going from good to great. Are you giving a you know, great service? Because nowadays, everyone's becoming aware of customer service. Even when we might go buy a jacket or a shirt or a suit or anything, even when we check it into a hotel, we're always conscious of the fact that how are we getting treated? Uh, yeah, as, as because, mentioned, because you're giving it. You're giving it, So correct. you notice it around you, and correct. that's the... Correct, and, and, uh, and um, uh, David was saying some great points, uh, the experience you give to your patients earlier, you know, I mean, I love your program where you talk about the ultimate patient experience, you know, um, and which is what we need to do, and again, most dental practices are not trained in that, and they need to actively be trained in this uh, scenario. There, there's so many things you can do. Also, the look and feel of your practice. Uh, as uh, you know, you mentioned Trevor. You mentioned how are you, when they come into your practice, you know how are you how are you kinesthetically, how are you visually demonstrating your practice? Very very important because if you're promoting yourself as a cosmetic dentist, and then you have a very shabby practice, it doesn't match who you are. It doesn't match your values. It doesn't match your belief systems. You know, so it's very important that the third point where you can win or lose a patient is in when the patient actually comes to your practice. And the fourth, I, I would say, is almost completely uh, dictated upon what the dentist does. So how are your communication skills, period? You know, how are, how are you uh, being able to case convert, as we call it, case conversions? How are your communication skills? How are you, uh, how are you reading your body language skills, et cetera, et cetera? Because people don't buy treatment plants, people buy the dentist. And I always, be, I always believe that people do business with people they like. You know, and uh, nowadays everyone's training themselves in terms of clinic, clinical skills, you know. How are they training themselves in terms of uh, communication skills? Very, very crucial to know that. Um, and it's again a, a skill most dentists don't possess, and, but it's an easily learnable skill. If they invest some time and money into learning that skill, it's, it's, everyone can learn that. I think it's an amazing skill to learn. Uh, it can help you anywhere with communication skills, I mean, in terms of your team as well. Uh, becoming a leader in front of your team, team members as well. Um, and that comes to the fifth point, once we all, as Dennis, consult with our patients, how are the treatment coordinators um, coordinating the treatment? So again, how many times have we noticed as Dennis that sometimes we feel that the patient has accepted the treatment plans, and then when they go to the treatment coordinators, so, you know, the shit hits the fan, and you suddenly and realize... it's the front girl. The front the girl, yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> and they don't book for any treatment. Yeah. So how is your treatment coordination, how is the culture your team culture handling the patient itself, you know? Um, so again, th those are the skills every dental practice owner uh, needs to learn and to grow a successful business. Um, and, and the last being uh, follow up and follow through. Most people are not taking enough action to follow up the patients who have not booked the treatments, the mm -hmm. patients who have not followed up, uh, uh, you know, follow through with the, with the incomplete treatment plans as well. Um, so there's a lot of strategy and skills in these six areas of uh, Key, or what I call key experiences you can provide to a patient. And, and I guess coming back to your point, what do you need to be, how do you survive in a market when there is so much supply 
and um, you know, and and so much supply of dentists, and then there's less demand. So how do you survive? You have to have a unique, different proposition. You, you need to be different, and it's no more about being good anymore. It's about how you take yourself from good to great, and and that's what I believe that all dentists need to be trained in that. Can I? I um. You know, I'm not in your space and I'm not a dentist, but what really blows me away is the requests that I get from dentists. I'm thinking about what you're saying about leadership. And I, I mean, we're basically engaged as an outside consultant to help people with marketing. And, that, and the dentist would say to me, look, can you, would you mind asking so-and-so if they could do such and such to implement this? Look, I'm not sure if they're gonna go for it or not, but just see if you can convince them that we should do this. And I'm thinking, Really? Like, yes. I'm not the boss here. I'm some external that's been brought in, and you're basically asking me to sort of try and manage the staff for you. Yes. And that, that's not unusual. Um, yes. Yes. Which is why I think there needs to be more awareness. I mean, all, all, all of us are trying to get dentists more aware that you really need to work on yourselves first. Work on the house first, as you said, uh, how, uh, then worry about what's happening outside. Work on your own house first. Work, you, are, you are the captain of your own ship. You know, make sure your ship is sailing first. And, and I think it's interesting how you make six, you said six points. Yeah. Number two is telephone, that's inbound sales. Correct. Number six is follow up, follow through, that's yeah. outbound sales. Yeah. And the least trained, lowest paid person in the whole business is that lady named after a piece of furniture. And that's all your sales and marketing. Yeah. And the fastest way to double your sales is double the number of phone calls answered correctly. Yes. <clears throat> double the number of outbound sales calls like, um, you canceled your cleaning last week, you never rescheduled. Uh, yeah. And then I also think it's interesting how dentists, um, you call it customer service, yeah. but in America there's so many people addicted to advertising that they call it the new patient experience. Yeah. They're That's always experience. burning and churning new patients and they don't realize that four out of five of their patients never come back. Correct. And it's yeah. not a new patient experience, it's patient experience for every patient, every time, all the time. Right. That, that patient follow-up has been a, a really powerful tool for me to share with practices. And they say that's made such a big difference. And yeah. and at first they're very resistant. And, and the resistance is I haven't got time to be following up patients with all the other things I have to do. So we make a deal. And the deal is, and this is what I did with myself, I did a five a day. And I said, look, if that's too many, just do two a day. And you can only go up from there. So every day, each person who answers the phone in a dental practice has to follow up with two people with outstanding treatment mm -hmm. or someone who cancelled an appointment and didn't reschedule even though we try and prevent that they make that commitment to themselves to make the two phone calls each day and it's like two times how many each week times how many right. each and it's huge and i'm not saying every single phone call they also need to know how to handle that call and what to say yes. And there's an art in that because you can't just say anything. Yes. You can't say, you know, I haven't seen you for five thousand years. What's going on? So Why didn't there you are things. Up, you yeah, yeah. 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 There are things. Oh, they'll get blue bit out there, I guess. Yeah. Um, but there are <laughs> things to say to be able to get them to a point where they were more likely to make that appointment. Then. So I like the way you say to have an action plan. Even yeah. if it's two or three people a day, yeah. have and an be action plan. Yeah. Be consistent and and Reco yeah. and don't make it like you're exercising every day or you're you know a commitment to yourself in the practice and that's what we did and it made a, it made a huge, huge difference for us commitment and consistency yeah. one of the principles of influence of charlini over charlini you know he says you got there's to, my teacher yeah i, I, love I went that to guy. arizona state university yes. uh ryan he's actually a good friends with tom and sharon Mattern. yes and uh he taught oh, asu Charlie. and he's got his, he sold 10 million copies of his book in it's, it's, it's a book every dentist should read, yeah. you know, The Principles of Influence. Um, you know, by I have Charlie. it in hard copy and I've got it on there. As yeah, well. I like that. It's, yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Actually yeah. teaches you it's name it's dropper, my goodness. And he, no, I emailed him, I've had Tom and Sharon email, I said, tell him to get on my show. He knows he's my heart. I'm kind of on his new book. Yes. yes. Is, is, did it come out yet? Which one? Is his new book? Yeah, it has. Um, uh, I can't remember his name, but it's out. Well, Sorry. he told me when his new book was out, he'd come on my show. Yeah, all right, okay. You should get it on the show. But I want, you to, I want everyone to know 
that we saved the best for last. <laughs> Dr. Angie. Dr. Angie. Everybody's been waiting the whole time for the best oh, for last. I don't know about that. There's quite a few amazing individuals here that, uh, you know, actually even David and, and Kina, uh, I, I always read your your emails and I go tick 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 yes I'm doing what he's saying which is fantastic I mean I come from a diff maybe a little bit different perspective uh, than most of because see we go to a lot of the seminars and things like that and, and some of us that have small surgeries and mine is a very small practice what, what does small mean uh, I mean it's just me, of me yeah and that I've only got two rooms and it's just me and my uh, hygienist and my therapist so I don't have you know, and I don't have the room to have, you know, four receptionists or anything like that. My surgery is very, very small, but it's very successful. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I made it like that is because from a very young age, I mean, I've been practicing nearly 27 years. Um, so from young age, I saw that, okay, what do I need to do to become a great dentist? And not, I don't mean just clinical, because I realised that that is just not enough. So obviously I invested a lot of time in learning about people and learning about the different personalities. So when a person, just when I meet a new patient, within a few seconds, uh, I, I know exactly what kind of personality they are, how I can approach them, what level I can talk to them, how I can add value to their, to their life. And that for me, that is the most important important thing. I connect with my patients to an amazing level, and I love it because I'm a, I love interacting with people. Absolutely love it. And uh, and I think I don't do external marketing. I do internal marketing. Okay, so I get most of my patients I refer, uh, and it just happens that I'm in a great location, so I get a lot of you know people that walk past and and see, and and I make sure that I put some you know, interesting things on the outside of my surgery because the building is a very old building. I'm just getting a new, I thought I gotta do something different. I'm sick and tired of seeing all these beautiful faces and beautiful smiles and you know, there's another one up there. So I thought I'll do something different. And so I've actually getting a light box which has a, a girl that you can't see her mouth. Um, and she's just sort of like a little bit scared and I've actually put up there, be kind. When you see somebody without a smile, give them our number. <laughs> nice. So uh, I thought, you know, just something different, and I've got a Facebook mm -hmm. uh, page uh, where I don't put before and after shots of my patients. I don't put, you know, the cases that I do. If you go in there, I do put quite a lot of motivational things, but most of them are all the gifts that my patients give me on a daily basis. They'll spoil me with wines and give, you know, cho chocolates, of course. Mm -hmm. I did notice that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and you know all you know different things that they give you from scratches to you know eight hundred dollar bottle wines, uh, which is fantastic. Yeah. So because I think to myself, if you know, yes, you can go to any side and see the before and after. But when people go into my web, you know, my Facebook page and the, well, not mine, but the surgeries web, you know, uh, page and see that all the gifts that they they offer us they'll think, like I would think, is wow, you know, they must value these this people and this is the place where I need to, you know, to go. So um, that's a different internal marketing uh, that I do. The other thing that, I, you know, yes, we need to survive with, you know, uh, the way things are now. I think one thing that us dentists need to remember is that, you know, when I graduated, we were colleagues. We were not competitors. All right, now we're competitors, and I hate that. You know, I mean, I, you know, I have people coming up to me and say, "Oh, did you see that person down the road? Um, you know, has this, this, and that. He's your competitor." I said, "No, he's not. You know, he's a colleague. I don't see anybody as a competitor. I still ring everybody in my area. The dentist when I go on holidays, and I say, "Would you mind seeing my, you know, emergencies?" And I don't think, "Oh my God, they're going to steal my, you know, my patients." So that's just, a, you know, like I said, from I do a lot of little internal internal things. I, I, I love my patients, I love talking. Um, I love explaining everything to them. Uh, I see them as a whole. I take care in, you know, sort of like in the, person, the personal issues that they have. I ask them to always uh, text me, um, even on my Facebook page, you know, private message, and they send me photos of, 
then we're going to break in tooth and say, what do I need to do? <coughs> so I give them that bit of extra um, service. Uh, and the other thing that I do, and that's, you know, like, I don't have to worry whether there's, a, there's, a, there's another, ooh, probably about eight dentists just walking distance around me. And I don't care. I don't, I don't worry. I don't search and see are they doing well or whatever. I don't care. It's, it's about my business and, uh, you know, sort of like how I'm going to install value in my patients so that they can refer other patients you know, other people to me. And it's, you know, I, I, it's worked fantastic so far. Uh, are, are you sure you're Greek because you use your hands so much? I think you're Italian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you Greek or are you just saying you're Greek? We're the same, Italian. same. Greek, Italian, you know. Greek, Italian. Be the same. Be the same. But, and then the other thing that I do that patients love coming in is, what you were saying about equipment and were saying, and you were saying, you know, don't buy the equipment, invest in, in the staff. You can do both. Uh, and the thing is, like, I invest, I, I buy a lot of equipment. I think the only thing I don't have is a Serac machine. That's because I don't, at the moment, I don't have to, space <laughs> to put it. Um, but I've got, you know, a lasers, I've got OPGs, I've got everything. And it's OPGs? Yeah, OPG. What's OPG? The... Panorex. Panorex. Oh, it's not what we call it. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's OPG simple? You, I think yours is really Ortho pantanogram. Yeah, they're with Ortho pantanogram? Yeah, pantanogram, yeah. Yeah, pantanogram. Yeah, yeah. 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 got CT. So I've got everything and it, they're in my she's group. A, she's APG and she's got an OPG. <laughs> very <laughs> good. Very, very good. good. Yes. And yes. Very good. 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 Very that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I have them there, and and I've got I don't hide everything, it, you know. Like well, some of us obsessed, we have really clean bench tops, and as in clean as in don't put any instruments. I have them all there because when my patients walk in, they go, okay, Angie, what's new today? What new day have you learnt? So they know they come into a place where I keep up with all the latest technology and I'm going to offer them all the latest treatments, whatever it's, it, it's out there. And then when you walk into my reception, the whole room, all around, everywhere, you'll see there's all the, uh, see, you know, wherever I go, any uh, conference, seminar, when I get a certificate, it goes up there. So when they walk in, even the new patients that come in, they sit in the chair and they go, oh, geez, you know. Do you have any time to yourself? You know, I see you're going to... They already know that, you know, I know a lot of things because I've been to so many things. So this is a little, you know, like I work a lot of my internal marketing that's, like I said, from a, a, a small practice point of view, it works really, really well. Am I ready to do some external? Yes, at this time in my life where I want to reduce my uh, working hours, and I want another dentist to, to come in, I'll probably go into the external marketing and then do a bit more of that um, and so I can bring some more patients in to share with the... Uh, okay, baby boomers like us, we read textbooks and we go to conventions. The, the people you're talking to, they're, they're millennials. They're, they're the ones who uh, enter Dental Town on the app. We enter on the desktop, they enter on the app. But, but so for those millennials, a lot of times they're wondering, um, I just got out of dental school, what type of dentistry should I learn? I mean, they, they always say like when I was in dental school, we didn't do in design, we didn't place an implant, we didn't do, they didn't do, they, they claim they didn't do anything but fillings, crowns. What, what clinical dentistry do you do? What have you decided not to do? If you were uh, talking to yourself and you were a D4 student and you're gonna graduate next year at age 24, 25, what clinical dentistry do you think is important to learn? Well, that's, that's really, you know, I mean, you, you've got to be able to, I think for me personally, you should be able to do a bit of everything initially. Um, and then, you know, go to, and that's what I did initially. I just went and learned a lot about all type, you know, the, you know, perio and, and, and endo and implants and all that. And then from there, then I can see what I really enjoy doing. Because, I mean, not all of us enjoy it. Like, I mean, I hate Rickenhouse, for example. You know what I mean? <laughs> Most of us do. So it's, it's an individual <laughs> thing. Go and learn about everything first uh, and be good. And then if you just decide not to do something because you don't like it and you don't enjoy it, then 
Don't do it. Yeah, doing something you don't like to do for money usually leads to disease and depression and burnout. Yes, no. absolutely, absolutely. And that's why I don't, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, is you know, I love my money and I love what money, I love my shoes and my bags, you know, <laughs> and, my, and my holidays. And I always, you know, on my screen in my computer, there's always the next destination where I'm going. And they sort of, like, the patient walk in and said, am I paying for that? I said, no, you know, I said, you're buying from my car. The, the, the patient before you pay for the holiday. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I, you know, we talk like that with patients and they, you know, they understand. But I'm there, you know, like I said, um, look, it, there's a little bit of a difference between men and women in dentistry, okay? It's the fact that us women cope with the stress of dentistry better uh, than men do, okay? And you're going to make us start crying. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, I know in my, well, my well, you know, my little circle of, uh, you know, dentists that I've known over the years, I know easily at least five men dentists, male dentists, that had nervous breakdowns um, and they had to be hospitalised. And, uh, you know... Suicides? Yeah. Four that I know. And we were just talking about one that happened yesterday yeah. that we all know. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know, four suicides. We all know one that just happened the other day. But why, why do you think women cope with stress? Better? Okay, because we've got different ways of letting go of the stress, whether it's, you know, the kids, uh, shopping, other girls. We won't put the husband there because we usually get more stress from the husband. So, <laughs> that's a different thing. But <laughs> I'm staying very quiet. <laughs> you, yours is yours is the here. Yeah, yeah, mine is not. Yeah. So, but he's um, very understanding. But we've got, you know, like I said, and we can choose not to work the long hours uh, that you men do and we can to, choose yeah. to give it up if we want yeah. to so if most of us so stereotypically yes. we're not so, and and excuse me for all the women watching this podcast is that stereotypically we're, we're not the bread winners in sometimes in that yes. relationship yeah yeah when not all the time that's but right yeah a lot of, okay. and i think so are you the breadwinner in europe with uh, your uh, at this moment yes i am actually so you're making more but, than your husband right uh, now it doesn't matter really but i'm i'm as you know, it, Kina, Kina knows me really well. Does it I hurt his masculinity that you make more money than Sorry? you? Sorry? Does it hurt your husband's ego no. that you make more money than you? No. He loves that all the other men envy him. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the incre <laughs> interesting trends in dentistry now because the change in demographics, not only in Australia but globally, is that the number of females that are graduating from dental school are, are way more than mm. uh, male mm. graduates. Mm. And, and in Australia, we've got a high percentage of uh, female Asians graduating. Yeah. <coughs> because those female Asians are the more intellectually capable in the population to be able to get the marks to get into dental school. That's right, yeah. Well, right. My, um, I've got a family full of vets, and there was literally a graduating year in Melbourne not too long ago when not a single male graduated. Wow. The entire graduating year was women uh, in vets. So yeah, I mean, I guess there's a trend similar in dentistry. Now, can I ask Angie a question? Is that all right, Howard? Of course. You, you eat your lunch and I'll... Of course, <laughs> Angus. Now, Anything for your brother, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Angie, I know that, um, you know, dentistry by women is kind of... That's something that's on your heart a bit. I just wanted... You know, we've heard the kind of, in a sense, the positive side of being a female dentist, stereotypically, maybe. But there are challenges as well. I mean, you've got a conference coming up. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, the, you know, there um, uh, we we suffer with the guilt of leaving our family. Uh, you know, sort of like leaving our kids behind and going to work and be judged by everybody else. How what what a horrible mother we are, uh, or, or what a horrible wife we are if we're not there for you know to cook our husband a meal. Uh, you know, things like that. Yes, we are. Do the ironing. The <laughs> <laughs> we still live in such an old-fashioned world. No, I don't think we do anymore. I think that's, that, that is our view, but we're of an age when I don't think people think like that anymore. Be Depends on where you are in the world. Yeah. I mean, we had, we, I, I, I had a, uh, my, my Facebook profile picture was of a woman dentist in the Middle East who was killed because ISIS caught her treating an office of sex. Yeah. Wow. I mean, there's areas of the country where a female dentist sure. treating a man will be killed. Yeah, yeah. Was that sad or what? Mm. 
Let's yeah. see, it's Western countries. There, there's countries right now where women dentists are not allowed to drive cars. <laughs> Am I kidding? <laughs> that, that's more than sad. That's tragic. But I think, it, it, but to the point, go back to about Western civilizations. It, yeah. If I look at my daughters, they certainly don't see their life as cooking, cleaning, washing, and ironing. Yeah. For for their husbands or partners, as as it may be, going forward, who knows? Yeah. Um, but but they see themselves as independent women equal uh, to any man and being able to do anything that men do yeah. in a business. Having said millennials. that, there's yeah. a lot of women that are yeah. very happy to be at home. <coughs> oh, absolutely. If you, know, if you want to hide no, something yeah. from a millennial dentist, yeah. you just put it in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> they, they only eat out for restaurants. <laughs> they, don't even have a, they don't even have a coffee pot. Yeah, they can only go to Starbucks. Yeah, so. Can I put that on my face? <laughs> <Yeah. Excellent. laughs> But it's exciting uh, that you are like, for example, you, you've opened this, uh, you know, you're part of this big group, women's <laughs> dental group, 1,500 members on Facebook. And I'm going to wear a dress and sneak into that conference. Yeah, yeah. 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 I need to wear a wig or just a dress? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get you. <laughs> I know, I tried. I and, know, uh, I read the thing and it said that, yeah, not, no, 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 no female dental yeah. consultants. But, <laughs> so but maybe the, point, the next one. But the point being you're empowering yes. fellow colleagues, fellow women yeah. colleagues. Well, that's, yeah. you know, like a... And the reason why, you know, I'm doing this because I've seen it over the years, the issues that, you know, us women had, um, you know, especially when the young ones, they don't get, you know, they, they don't get respect from the staff or the patients sometimes because yeah. they look yeah. so young. And I know, yeah. and even I went through it, you know, when I walk in and patients will freak out and say, uh, no, you're the nurse, you know, and I'm saying, no, I'm the dentist. And they'll be like, are you sure you can do that? You know, like. And Andrew, so, David's uh, probably his heaviest percentage of clients are, you wonder what I'm going to say now, women. are women. Mm -hmm. women. And, da yeah. and David even commented to me that part yeah. of what he does is try and nurture them into stepping up and becoming more leaders. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. But you know so why, so you know why most, most practice management consultants will tell you that of their millennial dentist, yeah. it's 80% it's, it's minimum women and more. Same reason we all thought, we were all educated 30 years ago, that 80, 90% of all TMJ was from women. Mm. So research started thinking, well, they should, maybe it's estrogen or this, that. It turns out that women are far more likely to raise their hand and ask for help. Mm. So the TMJ and TMD mm -hmm. and all that was equal among men and women, right. but the women were getting help. Mm. And same thing with um, consultants, mm. young female dentists are sitting there saying, you know this, I bet someone could help me with this, and they raise their hand. And it's so frustrating, men, when you're that they can't ask for directions, they yeah. can't ask for consultants. They it's something about their their ego, yeah. because they they can't admit that my office is really screwed up and everything's really yep. crazy. And and they don't they're actually afraid that you're going to come in there and say, God, man, you're you're not all that, and you're yeah. you're yeah, you're not all that. You're not a bag of chips, and you're you're kind of crazy. I mean, they're, so their ego is so it's actually fragile. Their ego is so fragile, they can't, they're so afraid that you're gonna come in and say, God, I've been in a hundred offices, this is the most messed up office I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I tend not to say that, Howard, because I don't get asked back, but yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I've actually, with Angie, we've been doing some bit of market research for this conference, and I've, I've been, you know, maybe naive, but surprised by some of the issues that the women have raised. I mean, uh, even we've had a couple of late people enter in the last few days and they've said things like, um, you know, not being taken seriously by patients. And it, it just would never have occurred to me that that yeah. would be an issue. But that's that's not an isolated comment from the women that we've had filling in this survey. So yeah. as much as things have moved on, you know, some people feel that they haven't. And isn't that just a perception in the dentist's mind because there's male dentists it may be, who yeah, fall it may in be. that same category. Yeah, it may in be. fact, you know, Omar Reid says that 95% of dentists get to the age of 65 and can't afford to retire because they haven't saved, they haven't earned enough True. and put it away. And and categorically, we find that it's an across the board thing. The thing, your group of, your online group of women evolved because of cyberbullying by a bunch of males in 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 one or two yes. chat forums, yes. and it's understandable. It's it's like a really pleasant place for these women to go. When I talk to the women who are on there, 
I'm not on there, but when I talk to them about it, they say, no, it's like Alice on, in Wonderland. It's like Alice in Wonderland. And get on there yeah. under no, different I've got names. a dress and I can't get on to it either. You know what, you know what um, <laughs> one of the most stressful things that young women dentists um, ask me about that their biggest issues? Their daddy's little girl and their dad's a dentist and she graduates and she goes back and she's working for her dad and it's so emotionally confusing because you're my dad but you're still treating me like I'm your little princess and she's trying to man up and say you know you shouldn't do the endo anymore you're using this illegal technique that's called Sargeni you could get your license taken away I need to do I mean she she has a hard time yeah how, how do you balance uh, you're my dad it's a choice and you need a spanking she makes a choice so she can make the choice to say okay you know what I need some space I'm going to open up my own or going to work for somebody else nobody's forcing you know why does she, do they have to go and work that's a worse thing but don't you think a lot of the dads guilt their daughter into I need to cut back I want I paid for your college you're gonna come in and work the family business your mom and I are counting on you and she's like yeah yeah but maybe just go and work for you know and say look I'll, I'd like to work with somebody else just to see how it is out there go and work for one or two days with your dad and just go and work somewhere else for a couple of days just to get a you know more experience from you know working for somebody else so they they need that it probably so, happens to sons as well as daughters though, in that environment as well we Mm. Children get guilted into going into their parents' business. Ryan tells me that he's now dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> he's only worked with me for two years, and he's dead. It travels he just... with that, Ryan. Yeah. I don't think it travels with that. Oh, isn't it? It's in the States. Like, we don't have, I don't know, personally know many female ladies who the fathers are dentists no, as well. No, no. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. You issue, know, yeah. It's, actually, it's actually around the world. Like, it, it, like I remember... Um, in New, when I lecture in New Delhi or in San Paul, it doesn't matter if you're in the United States, you say to the guy, raise your hand if, if you uh, are not the first dentist in your family. I mean, a quarter to a third of the hands yeah. go up. Really? Wow. You know, you know who's that really famous dentist from San Paul? Um, the, the DSD. Cr- Christensen. Christian, Christensen, yeah. Um, there's 35 dentists and lab techs in his family. Yeah. I went to a dinner at an Indian dentist house in Delhi and I mean, just in the house, I mean, just where they all live, it was, it was a family house. I mean, I don't even know how many there was, 18, 19, 20. So, so. Well, that's even, an Indian family. <laughs> but, 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 but I, 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 I've done, I've done, I mean, I know podcasts where the, the mom and dad are dentists and um, um, two of their kids uh, became yeah. dentists and they each married uh, a dentist in their oh. class. And there's six that we were in Singapore. Remember in Singapore, um, we did a podcast with a dentist. His wife is a dentist. He had um, one kid, and he married a girl in the class. So there's four dentists in in that one little office in Singapore. So so it doesn't matter. Like if you go to Tanzania and your dad and your grandfather were goat herders, well, what what's the best decision for you to do? Yeah. Well, you go into the family business. So I I think in all the dental schools. In all the lectures I've given, I'd say at a minimum, 25% of dentists are not the first dentist in their family tree. So where are the dentists here? Um, yeah. Us three. Three, yeah. Four. Okay, so of you three, how many of you were the first dentist in your family tree? And only. First and yeah, only. Yeah, first and only. Okay. Bad, bad focus group. That's a bad focus group. In the dental industry, and I kind we're of... We're going to call this podcast the F focus group. Yeah. This This focus group. Failed, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, family. But even last names like Smith means your your father's a blacksmith. My last name Foran means baker. Um, you know, so even even names are. Uh, Can I? Do you reckon? Because um, I've had a couple of clients. In fact, I literally spoke to a lady yesterday who's a dentist, and she was saying, "Oh, you know, I've been in dentistry for thirty years, but my I don't think it was daughter. I think it was daughter-in-law is third year dental." And I just want to keep the practice going so I can hand it over to you. I just wondered, because um, both of the examples I can think of were both from the subcontinent. I don't know, is that a stronger thing there, do you reckon? Or? Subcontinent. Yeah. yeah right. In mean, Indian descent or Sri Lanka yeah, or whatever course. the case. Uh, but my dad's a doctor. Uh, I'm the second born. Uh, my brother studied dentistry. And so then I you weren't the first dentist in your family. Yeah, look, so in my family. But the most people I know, these very limited uh, same profession in the family uh, not in, in this country in this country 
Uh, but I understand where you're coming from. Like in India, it's a secondary thing. Yeah, this lady was breaking like this. Professionals in the family, everyone will be a professional. Of few generations down, wow. no? Um, but, uh, you yeah, well, I don't know. Because I, I coach and lecture quite a bit, I've not met many people who are in the same, same league, in the same family. No? But yes, uh, I agree that... Uh, Another interesting thing I yeah. found uh, uh, that I uh, very interesting in, in uh, Australia, like yesterday when I lectured in Melbourne, I said, what percent of the class was not born in Australia? It was 85% of, of the class. Yeah. Yeah. You, were you born in Greece? Yeah. We're in Athens or yes. Sparta? Yes, Athens. Athens, wow. David was born in Penang. Yeah, I was born in Malaysia. Were you? Oh, were you? Yeah. Okay. Were you? I was in Penang. I was here. In Penang. Malaysia. I was here, but I was born in Penang. Oh, yeah. 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 I was made in Australia, but to live it over there. How about you, too? I was born in Africa, in Kenya. I was about to say Kenya. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was born, in, so I know Tanzania very well. And, uh, so I got to tell you, I, I um, when I was in Kenya, um, you know, everybody hears of the spice route, you know, from uh, India all the way to the Roman Empire. Rome was the first city to hit a million. So to have those spice routes from India, every 20 miles had to have an Indian family. Yes. So you, so every along that trail is heavy Indian descent all the way to Rome. Yes. Because they would uh, pack up those, um, they, they, you would just take it 20 miles and give it to the next family. Correct. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So what is your favorite spice then? If oh. you're born in Kenya, <laughs> you're born in Kenya? Born and raised in Kenya, yes. Then you were trading um, sugar, cinnamon, C cinnamon. What, what, what was the main spice? It was sugar, cinnamon, sugar, salt? Sugar, cinnamon, salt, just... Every spice, man. Yeah. Well, you're, you're Indians are, it's every spice. Yeah. So you just never, never, never dictate one spice in their life. <laughs> it's the spice of life. Chili. Chili. So, so I want to go around the table um, uh, again, one last time, because, again, we're baby boomers. We read textbooks. We go to bricks and mortar convention. I went, these are, we're talking to millennials. They're all born after 1980. So go around, there are D2s, D3s, D4s. And by the way, thank you, I keep asking you, send me an email, howard at dentaltown.com, and just tell me your age, because about one out of every, it, it's pretty rare, maybe one out of 50, says, hey, I'm an old fart like you. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm 55 years old, I enjoy this podcast. But most of them, I cannot believe 20% are D2, no, D3, D4. I mean, 20% of all the emails, like, they're still in dental school. Oh. So, and then the rest are, they're either a, a working as an associate, corporate, they're trying to get their own, but what advice would you give? Let's say that she's gonna, let's say that um, she graduated uh, this year, She's working for an associate, private practice or a deal. She wants to have her own dental office someday. Mm -hmm. She's 25. What advice would you give her? And her goal is to grow up and be like you someday. <laughs> um, and that'd be an awesome goal, an amazing goal. Of course. So what advice, how, do, how does she get from 25 to 36? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, love you. <laughs> I think you get someone in between me and that spot because I, my immediate reaction is if I'm going to get into a practice, I want to be doing all the analysis of the neighbourhood and so on and find out how much competition there is. That's not our expertise. But once the business is up and running, um, I mean, it's interesting to me a bit of a theme around this table about measurement. And so really knowing where, you know, where your business is coming from, what all your numbers are and tracking that stuff because maybe that's just my predisposition, but I don't find that stuff that hard and you know, anecdotes is one thing, but what do the numbers say? Where are you winning? Where are you losing? What can you do to optimize? That would, honestly, I just do the basics well. That's probably my main message. Yeah. Nice. There's, David. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors out there, and one of my mentors says, if you want to be successful in any location, just go and see what everybody's doing, and then just do the opposite. I was, <laughs> I was, I was in business for nine years, and uh, my neighbor, a very successful practice, supposedly long-term practice, was selling his practice, it was two dentists, and their building, and I went to see them, and I'd been in business nine years, well, they would, one guy was doing 100,000, one guy was doing 200,000, I was doing 400,000 on my own. And these guys have been in business 30 years, this is back in the 90s, wow. and they were known as a very successful practice, so their numbers didn't match their perception. Mm. So check who your competition is, find out what they're doing, ring and find out how bad the phones are being, are being answered and set up next door to those people because there's plenty of opportunity right under your nose. You don't have to go out and be the only dentist 
in an area, or the first dentist in an area, unless you're so weak that that's all you can do is be the best because you're the only one there. But you can certainly be the best by just planting yourself beside. Michael Hill, the jeweler, did it in Arrowtown. He worked for his uncle. He said, my uncle's got a huge business. He doesn't need all this money. I just want to have part of his business. He wanted 25% of his uncle's business. Well, he got it in Arrowtown. Then he thought, well, I'll get it in the South Island. Then I'll get it in the whole North Island. Then I'll go to Queensland on the Gold Coast. And he's, got, he's the biggest jeweler in mm -hmm. Australia now, just by taking a small piece of big business. And you can do that in dentistry. You don't have to. Remember that 25% of the population, whether they're talking about their teeth, or the guy who cleans their pool, the guy who mows the lawn, the person doing their nails or their hair, they don't care what the competition charges because they're getting a good service and a good product. You can get that in dentistry. You only have to be good to 25% of the population. But if you chase after the other 75% who are always price conscious, then you're just gonna wear yourself into suicide, heart attack, depression, whatever. Go for the top 25%. Easy. Yeah. That's all I did. Well, I'm so gonna base mine looking at, at where you came from with dentistry, how you worked for other dentists. And you had a, a sort of, you worked for some good dentists who sort of sort of mentored you in a, in a way that even if, from your observation of them and how they were running their businesses. Um, I think that is always a good start before you make that for dentists, making that big jump, just from the dentists I, I speak to, and especially the ones that I work with that have just started out. Um, they're the smart ones because they've rung me to say, I need help straight away, and I love them because I think they get it straight away, mm -hmm. and they're going to do it right from the, the, the start. Um, so that, you know, they've got that ability then to, to really take their practice and grow and, and, but the mentor side, I think it's, you know, if you, can, if you can sort of line yourself up with people who are doing the right thing in dentistry and are really, really working it well and to learn and, and, and to get people in to, to help you. Um, that was one of the best things. See, what David and I do with other practices, we're going into their practices and working with them because that's what we did in our practice. But obviously not with ourselves because we weren't at that that we didn't know anything at that point that we mm. needed we needed that assistance and that help so you know that was one of the biggest turning points wasn't it for the practice was when you got um, well, that's true management yeah. people in because yeah. after I looked at that practice and I was doing four hundred thousand I had a, a management firm come and help me for six and a half years and I went from four hundred thousand to one point two million in six and a half years I tripled my practice in six and a half years mm. just with that advice of having somebody to bounce ideas off. Having a mentor or a coach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I doubled my yeah. practice. Did you guys ever see the movie Breaking Bad? Yeah. Where that guy was making crystal meth? Yeah. I brought in a chemist in my office and we've been converting Novocaine <laughs> into cocaine. <laughs> and selling cocaine out the back door to his brother. And, uh, Is he staying in the podcast? Uh, 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 Brian has heavy editing powers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Trevor, so, so what advice? I actually have a niece who's uh, doing a second year of dental school now and I said to her, don't, um, don't ever forget that uh, you don't stop learning once you graduate. Yeah. Yeah. You need to keep learning. I agree with what's been said around mentor. You need to find yourself some good mentors, um, but not just in dentistry. You need to find some mentors that are broad in life. But obviously, having a good uh, dentist uh, to mentor you is very important. So you need four or five of those to, to guide you uh, effectively, and then um, to really find what you are passionate about in dentistry. What is the sort of dentistry you want to provide? Mm -hmm. You really have to understand that. So, do, do you want to really specialise and become a specialist, uh, or do you want to provide? good general practice or the best general practice you can so what within your general practice do you really want to focus on what do you want to be really good at so because at the end of the day patients get your intent yeah so so make sure the patients understand your intent. and you're right you should have a lot of mentors I think everyone is so lucky they have five their five favorite mentors are a cook a gardener, a driver, a spouse, and a lover, and that those aren't the same. And that's all the same that those are all five different people. The cook comes first. Well, I'm the cook comes first. Because <laughs> one of my mentors. Is I love that. Right. Uh, yeah. But uh, Kanar, what would your advice be to a young 25-year-old dentist? Live life. 
um, don't get burned out by this profession. Um, I, I guess one of the questions I ask uh, young Dennis is, uh, what do you want? To, what, do, what, do, what do you want to do? What do you want to become when you do dentistry? And the, the, the answer I generally get is, I want to become successful. And, and then I'm asking the next question I ask is, what does success mean to you? You know, and uh, most of them say, you know, I want to have a nice house, steady job, big practice, etc. And, uh, I'm, and I'm, I'm always like, that's fair. I mean, everyone wants that. I agree that that's a great answer. But I would add that success is not about having possessions and what you achieve in life. It's about who you become at the end of the day. What all that journey you take throughout life and become successful, what does that make you as a person? And, uh, and which leads to the three points I always tell them, that these are the three traits everyone needs to have to become successful in life, which is the first trait being just be humble in life. As much as you are in a profession of growth and success, you just be humble. Be humble to others, add value to them, you know, grow with others. Don't become a competitor, become a colleague. You know, as uh, Angie said there as well, be humble. Do a self-discovery process of what your strengths are. You know, there's a lot of coaching that can happen to individuals. We, we graduate as dentists, but no one trains us in these kind of things. What are our individual strengths? And work on the strengths and your talents. So become humble. The second um, uh, thing I talk about is be hungry. You know, if you're, if you, you, it's, it's not a time in life for Dennis to be peckish anymore. You can't become <laughs> peckish anymore. You peckish. Be peckish means like you want to nibble on things. You want to be hungry. If you want to be successful, you've got to be hungry. You've got you to gotta have that almost like an obsession that you want to you wanna invest in yourself. You want to grow. You know, you want to you wanna work on yourself. You want to work on your personal self and your professional self. So be hungry, man. You can't just walk around saying that I want to be successful. Success doesn't fall from the tree. You gotta really work at it. And, and, and the last uh, word which most millennials like on that is learn how to hustle at the end. Learn how to hustle. This is the doggy dog world. So you gotta learn the six areas I was talking about. Um, you really gotta learn how to hustle in life, you know, um, while adding value to others. Learn how to take action. You were saying take two steps, one step every day. Whatever it is, take one step every day, but learn how to hustle. Can you be a humble and a hustler at the same time? Of course. Yes. Of yeah. course. <laughs> humble is about just being humble to people, but hustling in terms of keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Take a step every day in your growth. Um, you know, uh, humble is just contributing to the world, contributing to others, thinking of others while you're growing as well. And of course, knowing your own self. Too many people talk about their successes, too, too less people talk about their failures. Talk about your failures more. You know, that's what people learn from. So I, I, I guess when you're growing uh, millennials, talk about your failures as well, you know? Um, and that's the, that's the message I would give them. There's so much to go, live life while you're at it. Yeah. Uh, the three H's. Yeah, being- well, that, that on Facebook now too. The yeah, three H's. The three, H's of the three H's of leadership. The three H's. The three H's of leadership. Being humble, I being think, humble. I think that, I think that young dentists need to learn to respect what they've done. And this is, this is one thing that I find with my clients. They don't respect that they have spent so much time and money getting themselves an education in dentistry, yeah. and then so much money investing in either buying a practice or setting up a practice, and they have that personal debt that they need to repay. So they need yes. to make their services pay for this pass. So to then have that huge amount of time and money that they've invested, and then start being a cost cutter, that's just it the, work. It's, it's the wrong way. It's yeah. the wrong way. It, the pie is big. We want to grow the pie. Yeah. And, you know, think abundance. Yeah. yeah. And there's plenty of abundance. So when yeah. you think in that top 25%, yeah. those are the people who don't mind. But who looked at the prices here today for dinner, for lunch? Nobody did. Yeah. yeah. We just eat what we eat. We enjoy it. I didn't look because I took Angie's you credit card out. <laughs> She wasn't looking, and uh, she paid for everyone. Not having that value, you know, for for, yeah. for what you do and what value you give to others is sometimes and let go of ego. There's yeah, a lot yeah. of ego. Yeah, a lot of ego. A lot of ego in dentistry. I don't know about overseas, but a lot of ego. Have you heard the the joke? What's the difference between a dentist and God? What? God hasn't realized he's a dentist yet. <laughs> oh my God. I'm going to steal that one. I'm going to steal that one. That is so great. Um, well, it's, it's dentists, physicians, and lawyers. Their ego is off the charts. I mean, it's just off the charts. What, why is that? I don't know. I, I, I really 
don't know. It's probably I mean, my, like, my, my joke on that was um, um, Bible, no, um, doctor is a Latin word, um, docere meaning to teach. Bible is just a Latin word meaning um, book. And God is just a Latin word meaning dentist. <laughs> 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 oh God! Yeah. I oh, look, and the ego—that's the other thing—is with this this majority of them just gets in the way of most things that they do. Uh, you know, whether it's the presenting something to a patient, and the patient says, oh, "I can't afford that," and the ego goes up and says, "What?" You know, well, you know, you got to be like you said, that humble, and you got to, uh, you know, you got to show empathy. So, if I was going to say anything to these young dentists that are coming out, I'm going to say, you got to have patience. Because I have so many that come out that have been out for one or two years. I want to open my own practice. And I look at them and I'm going, you can't even have, you know, like a steady conversation with me. How are you going to be able to hold a practice? Business, yeah. And they're all, all, all they see is this dollar sign. Okay? That's all they see. Uh, they want to own the practice right away. And I'm like, uh, no, just build up your confidence. Build up your knowledge build up your skills and then go out there and do what you need to do. But don't just go without having all that ammunition behind you yeah. just because yeah. you think, and, and they, they actually, when we have the conversation, that's exactly what they say, but I'm gonna make more money when I have my own practice. I think False perceptions. Well, David, David and I are very fortunate I get that right. a lot of the dentists that we, we work with They've already got yes. past their ego a bit because they've had to reach out and ask for help. Yeah, yeah. So yes. they've that's, actually, that's, that's and you're the same. same yeah, yeah, so yeah, from that consult, and you would find that too. I've had to eat dirt and yes. yeah. so they pick up the phone. Yeah, yeah, so they've sort of got past that bit of a barrier and they're, they're starting to realise that they can't do it all by themselves. But it's really disconcerting that people are in the yeah. profession of making yeah. money as opposed to healing. Yeah. You know, that's where they must intend. You know, if they've chosen dentistry because they want to be yeah. rich. Yeah, but then the other side of it is what we have to be very careful is that they don't believe, they still have to keep a hold of their business because they're not helping any patients if they go out of business. Yeah. And there's a lot of dentists that are struggling out there and they're actually closing their doors. There's not a truth. So they're not most, helping patients. I would agree, there's most yeah. dentists who are struggling right now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and as Angie was saying, you know, most dentists are jumping into opening practices up yeah. It's it's not easy nowadays. I mean, the most mm. practices I coach as well, um, I've, I've noticed a pattern that most practices as a business are not making enough profit. Mm. You know, um, the, the you know the dentists are taking their own commission, but the business is not making any reasonable profit. Yeah. Um, so which begs to kind of ask, do you, and, and the stress is involved in running yeah. practices. Yeah, but that's because they've got stress because they haven't okay. learned how to deal with it? people. And it's so important now, like, you know, if you do your NLP courses, all right, that is, I think that is one of the most important things that people need to know when they have any business. doesn't matter whether they're dentists, whether you've got a restaurant, whatever, you you can no know, if you're going to deal with people, you got to know how to treat these people and well, also know how to point deal point with yourself. So, you know, if, if you're, yeah. you don't know how to deal with them, well, then, you know, you're having, you know, I, I see it in, even in the, in the women's group you know the questions that some of them put or even in the other forums and they say oh this patient came in and, 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 and we had this confrontation what should I do and I'm going it's too late now you already the had the confrontation <laughs> <laughs> learn how to deal with it before yeah. you know, so you've already, news for the next one <laughs> exactly and you've already yeah. lost yeah. not just that patient but you've lost all the patients that that person is going to go yeah. and tell now that oh my god that dentist don't even bother going but the no. good news is it's a learned skill that to be able to communicate yeah, with the patients. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe not attitude, but having if you've got the right attitude and you're still not quite nailing that communication, you can learn to do that. Oh, they don't, they don't. I guess all skills are, yeah, you're right. Yeah. All skills can be learned, yeah. but, but invest in yourself, yeah. which is the biggest thing, the millennials. Yeah. Invest not in just in clinical skills, but in your personal, you know, personal yeah. skills. And that's because so yeah. many now that they think that IQ is so important, to be successful. It's not, it's EQ, it's that emotional quota. It's that relationship that you, you, you can, you know, sort of like nurture with people yeah. that's gonna drive your business and then make you yeah. successful. It doesn't matter whether, you know, you score 99. And uh, you can practice yeah. at home. Yeah. <laughs> In that practice. Yeah. Yeah, practice at home. Quite, quite a social question though, going back to the point about in, in money, and this is what, in, in Australia at least, has been a, a challenge because uh, pharmacy's gone through it and general practice has gone through it. Is that should healthcare make a profit? 
you know, sh or should dentists be paid well to find well? well that's a question. But should help, should a healthcare professional make a profit? Absolutely. No, no, no I'm saying it's like a social question. If you if you look at the Labor Party and Nicola Roxon started this in 2007, suggested that. Uh, dentists were well paid and making too much profit in their business. Now, if you go back to that initial question, if you, no, no, I'm just saying, but if you look at the food chain, the d doctor's office makes more margin, more profit yeah. Yeah. than anybody else in the food chain. And so I think that's one of the questions that the industry and well, the I know, I, work but I the profit, though, the profit goes back into the economy. Yeah. 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 yeah, the problem yeah. goes to support but, but housing, still, it goes to I, support... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's a broader subject yeah. because there could be an argument to say if it was, and this was, again, some politicians have put this forward in the past, but say um, if prices were less expensive, then more people would go to the dentist. And we know in Australia, and New Zealand for that matter, but then there'd be less people being dentists because the margins would be so low. So yeah. then we'd have to work on a socialist scheme like the National Health, which is just a merry-go-round. You ever been in a pub in England and talked to them about their dentist? Yeah, absolutely. Who's your dentist? Oh, him. I've just started going to him because my last dentist was really bad. Yeah. Well, guess what? He's just replacing, that person's just replacing another patient who's just moved on to the next dentist. It's yeah. just a progressive got, barn dance of people's going around. Nobody's getting good dentistry. I've got lots of mates who are dentists in the UK. I know exactly what they are. Yeah. You know, it's how much to... These people pay for their iPhone. That's right. Yeah, and, all their tattoos. All their tattoos. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Are there, are there oh, drugs? I got to my dentist. Look at my tattoos. And, 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 and that was my point. So about, about, you you would not believe how many poor people in the United States have a $30 a day drug right. program just if they're on a pint of vodka and a couple packs of six. Yeah. And it's, and it's $100 a day. If they're on meth, coke, ecstasy, pills, whatever, and, and, that's, that's and then they don't have any money to go to the dentist. That's my point about where the competition so, is. that change? The competition is not in, uh, and I like the idea about being colleagues, it's not about the guys operating next door to you. It, the competition is where those people choose to spend the discretionary income. Because yeah. dentistry, I think a little bit regrettably, has become a discretionary spend. It's a choice people make. I have, I, have, I have some friends who are way more wealthy than I'll ever be. Yeah? And, and they complain. They, you know, one guy said to me, he said, I've got my two kids going through orthodontic treatment at the moment. That's all I'm prepared to spend. This guy's got a Ferrari in the background. Yeah? Yeah. He says, I'm not prepared to spend any more money on dentistry. So my wife and I aren't going to the dentist. I said, you're an idiot. He's got the wrong person working on the front. Yes, no, no, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but he can't, pay. He's not, he can't afford to pay. It's just he's saying, of this, of what I. That's there, yeah. Head, that's what I'm prepared to but say. But that, but that's that's the one thing I've learned as you get older and older and older. That you know, at 54, the the, the path to happiness is just keep lowering your expectations <laughs> <of people. laughs> because at the end of the day they're just the only animal in the zoo with clothes on uh, I mean, they're, that's, they're, they're, yeah. that's cool though I love that I'm, yeah. I want to steal that off you I mean, and the other thing that's very really interesting um, is um, how people can be so smart in one area and a Neanderthal in five other areas yeah, sure. like some, some of the smartest people I know are just I, I, I kind of leave the brain as like a box of ping pong balls, and some of those balls are just like perfect. Some are missing, some are broken, and it's amazing. Oh, send them so that bounce yeah, out. it's amazing. I mean, you, you can be a nuclear physicist and not be able to figure out how to use your microwave. I mean, you know, I mean, you can be a dentist and not figure out how to make profit. Oh, yeah, indeed. yeah. Ow. And, 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 uh, <laughs> True. I mean, uh, yeah. And look, look at the uh, the biggest name leaders running the world today. I mean, the, these guys. I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? I mean, so, some of the craziest people I've ever heard of in my entire life are now running my country. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, really. I, mean, I would have just... thought you were talking about Australia. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but I just, but I just... One of the policies that we teach, and you teach it too, is hire, hire slowly and fire quickly. Well, this guy's yeah, firing course. quickly, isn't he? Yeah. He's your guy? Like, well, I say, I'm, you, you, you know, I, I've been, the first time I voted was uh, uh, for uh, Reagan in 1980. You know, it was Reagan, uh, I guess, is Jimmy Carter, but... I've always felt every election in the United States was 
you just get two choices. Do you want to die of a heart attack or cancer? <laughs> Would you like your leg amputated above or below the knee? Really? That's all my choices? I mean, how does a third of a billion people come up with two choices, uh, heart attack and cancer? But um, I seriously, guys, I um, can't tell you, Angus Pryor, Dr. David Moffat, Jane Bandy, um, Trevor Martin, Dr. Kinar Shaw, Dr. Angie Pavis. And it was such an honor that you would come today on this beautiful day, sitting here by the bay in Sydney, and talk and share your wisdom with my homies. They're appreciating it from uh, Kansas to Kathmandu. Thank you, seriously. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming. Thank you, Thanks for having us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.